All right, everybody, let's have some good fun with this topic this week. I mean, we are having a real conversation about contract negotiations. No foo-foo, no sugar and spice, none of this kind of, oh, tell everybody how great you are and put your outcomes in front of them and everyone's going to raise your rates. I'm so sick and tired of hearing that. I'm sure you guys are like, well, isn't everybody going to do that? Isn't everyone taking that approach? True. <laughs> Most people are nervous. Most people are... Um, worried that it's going to be a confrontational conversation and therefore they just don't even attempt contract negotiations that raise their rates you know i've been in offices it was about three years ago i traveled down to louisiana and i went into an office and i was doing a practice evaluation and i looked at their average reimbursement and i knew what it was for that area and it was a good 10 or 11 dollars it may have been 12 dollars under the average per visit or average collections per visit of that marketplace. And I said, when was the last time you guys like approached your commercial carriers and got an increase? Cause you're not going to approach Medicare, right? So don't even try that. That's a set fee schedule. But they said it's been over 11 years since we even talked to one of our reps. And I was like, what? So there is this thing called cost of living adjustment. And this is a documented value that the government puts out each and every year. There's also this thing, as you are all well aware, called inflation, right? I mean, over the last 36 months, the cost of eggs has gone up 37%, right? So there is a justifiable reason for you in 2024 to absolutely dial for dollars by calling your carriers and your payer sources and saying, hey, look, let's have a conversation about where we're at in terms of the reimbursement that we are getting for servicing your patients, your members. I wouldn't even use the word patients. I would say members, your members, okay? So we're going to role play this at the end of this podcast. I'm going to take this podcast into three distinct sec sections, if you will. Section number one, I want you to focus on the work and preparation that goes into the contract negotiations before you ever pick up the phone and talk to Blue Cross, Aetna, Signum, anyone. Anyone really, United Healthcare, anybody. There's a lot of prep, and I'm, I've, I made a list here. It took a whole page uh, of notes here for me to get all my thoughts out about the things that I want you to prepare in preparation of that phone call that I think are going to arm you and support you in your conversation, not argument, but in your conversation with the payer rep. Number two, I have another list that is somewhat similar but different, that is, that I feel are the most important elements that are gonna provide you with leverage. So when you enter into a conversation about trying to gain agreement on a topic of any sort, in this case it's reimbursement, increasing reimbursement rates, you need to have a case, you need to have a, a point, you need to have leverage, you need to have a reason or a justification for why you feel the way you do and why should that person even entertain the idea or concept um, that you're pitching, right? So let's just call that leverage. So number one, data research, section two, leverage, and then section three, we're going to do some role play. So for those of you who are just listening here on my podcast, you're going to hear this role play back and forth. For those of you on YouTube watching this video, you're going to see me play both parts. So that should be kind of fun and entertaining. I have nothing scripted for that. We're just going to go off the cuff. I'll talk and share with you uh, conversationally how I would do it and successful actions that I've shared with others and that others have shared with me. So this is just 30 years of accumulated uh, experience and uh, training that we're just going to put right out here for you on this podcast and on this YouTube channel today. So let's get rolling. I hope this is going to be an action-packed informational uh, episode for you. Uh, it is the re Our title here is The Real Talk on Contract Negotiations, and I'm going to try and keep it as real as possible. So let's rock and roll. Let's get started. Like I said, phase one, data collection. Well, part of data collection is looking at yourself. You go into this contract negotiation with confidence, certainty, and conviction, okay? Confidence, certainty, and conviction, the three Cs. Don't even think about dialing that number unless you're confident about your position, you have total certainty in your practices, outcomes, performance levels, specialty services, all the things we're gonna talk about next, and you have conviction. Like you are, conv you are just like, I am not gonna take no for an answer. Like there is, I am gonna leverage so effectively that I can't believe you wouldn't 
feel the passion. You wouldn't be sweating on your brow uh, at the effort and energy I'm putting in that's making you even tired hearing me because we are that good. You have to be that convincing, not salesy. I, I, I'm diametrically opposed against salesy. It's like I had two practice owners call me yesterday, one at eight in the morning, one at 5.30 at night, and I did uh, what we call a practice assessment call. I just assessed their practice. Both of them are in the process of wanting to buy out their existing owners in their practice. One's a junior partner and one's not. One's just a staff clinical director. And boy, they had conviction. Boy, they had purpose. Boy, they had, you know, desire. But both of them lacked confidence and certainty. So they were convicted, like, this is the best thing for my life. They were, you know, certain that this had to happen but they didn't have the confidence in how to do it. Well, who does? Who got taught how to buy a practice? So of course, you know, they signed up on their coach. I'm putting them through training and then coaching and training and then coaching. I find that when you have a human being assisting you and and implementing things with you, holding you responsible, holding you accountable for your learning and not just your learning and not just your bright ideas or not just your assimilation of information, but somebody who actually holds you accountable for your application of that information for your skill development. That's coaching. I would die if somebody called me a consultant. The last thing I want to be, ah, stab me with a butter knife. Last thing I want to be is a consultant. Consultant somebody who gets a big check, gives you a bunch of bright ideas, and whether you win or lose is of no concern of theirs at all. They're on to the next client, the next city, the next service. Not my cup of tea, not my industry, not where I live on a day-to-day basis. I want to be your personal coach in giving you skills, training, knowledge, education, experiences that you can then apply in a developed skill, in a newly developed skill skill that elevates your game, that elevates your performance for your wealth, your riches, your independence, your time freedom, your quality of life, your ideal scene. Everybody needs a little helping hand from time to time and they have to invest in themselves in getting it. So those two guys, you know, came on and One came on, one is looking at the situation to come on because they have to work out some details first. But I'm really hoping and and, and, and praying, I guess you would, that they do choose to move forward because I know I can help them. I just know I can help change their life. And that's how I feel about this contract negotiation. So you have to have that degree of confidence. You have to have that degree of personal investment in your practice and in this opportunity to pick up the phone and call your pair source and ask for more money, more reimbursement for what you're doing. So here's some of the data you need to collect. Get your pen out, go ahead, bullet point this out. I'm gonna go right off my list. Number one, know what your population is within a 30 minute drive, not as the crow flies, drive of your practice. Within a 30 minute drive of your practice, that is your patient population. Number two, how many practices are serving the population in that 30 minute drive, okay? So a 30 minute drive has 30,000 people. How many clinics? Well, maybe we have three clinics. Okay, that's 10,000 a clinic. Are we saturated? Are we unsaturated? Where do we fall? Saturated is any marketplace that has a number of clinics, I don't know how to say this, uh, as a ratio to the number of people in that market that falls below 5,000 per clinic. So if you divide the population by the number of clinics within a 30 minute drive and the head count falls below 5,000 per clinic, saturated. I have had uh, countless numbers of startup clinics that open up in markets of 5,000 to 10,000 people and they succeed and they thrive and they prosper quite well. Five, five and a half employees in a 2,000 square foot, 1,500 square foot office you can be supported in that market ratio. But you need to know, like, are we saturated? Are we unsaturated? Again, data list. Number of referring providers that you could potentially be servicing. How many actual referring providers live in that marketplace or service that marketplace? Their clinic or their doctor office may be 45 minutes from you, but they service people in your community, right? They're still your market. You drive an hour away to go see that doctor's office, even though they're not within a 30 minute drive of your clinic because they're treating the people that are. So, and we're talking all kinds of referring physicians, internal medicine, cardiologists, neurologists, general practitioners, orthopedists, okay? So don't just go for the orthos and GPs. There are a lot of people that could be referring to you, to be honest with you. Then next thing you should figure out, and a lot of people get stumped right here, what is the cost per visit? What does it cost you to deliver a visit of physical therapy care? You should know that. Um, what, um, what is this insurance carrier that you're going to be calling each and every one that you have on your list? What are they currently paying you per visit? You should know that. Like you don't guess, don't like 
double check that number and make sure you know that for sure. What services are you providing that others are not? That's a very important data collection point. Are you providing pediatrics, speech therapy? Are you doing uh, the newbie Easton, which is a neuromuscular rehab uh, protocol that many, many other people don't even have even heard of or doing, and you're going to be getting greater results, much greater results than your competitors. So you want to know that. Any other specialty services you're doing, TMJ, dry needling, laser, I don't know, what other specialty, you know, 3D running, um, HRV, you know, pulse magnetic therapy, um, just the, some of those are cash-based businesses, uh, but maybe you have some manual therapy services. Maybe you're a McKenzie trained certified provider. Put that down, right? You know, anything that makes you the zebra in the pack of horses, you need to know that and collect that data point. What is your average units per visit? You should have that handy. What is your average length of stay from eval to discharge? How many visits are you, uh, on average, administering and skilled physical therapy care before you've reached your long-term outcomes and, and, and people have been discharged. Let's face it, you're not a chiropractor, right? Chiropractors will treat patients until they get bored or run out of money. I mean, I, I don't know. I've not seen one that sat down and wrote a plan of care evaluation, short-term, long-term goals and said, you know what, Mrs. Smith, we've done all we can do here. You've achieved all your goals. Maybe there's a chiropractor in the, world, in the whole wide world that, that exists, that that's their mentality, but that's not what I've seen. That's not what I've heard. That's not how I see it going down. I see people running out of money or running out of time. So separate yourself from that philosophy. Make sure that you have a geared plan of care that is engineered to achieve short and long-term goals in the quickest order possible that's most efficient, but yet the greatest resolution for the patient. I'm not a fan of six visits and out or two visits and out, and I'm not a fan of 22 visits and out. I'm a fan of the appropriate number of visits that gets the person to the highest performing level possible in the shortest period of time. Functional independence and optimal health is what we're all about. Make sure that you have that message and make sure you run your practice like that. I mean, you can't fake it, right? So what is your success rate in achieving short long-term goals? What is your success rate on a net promoter score? What does your EMR system tell you about your clinical success rate? Document that, track that, plot that. Um, find out when your rates were last adjusted, right? I feel like I'm just lecturing here, bam, bam, bam. But I got a lot to cover, so I'm sorry I'm going so fast. I just wanna make this as effective for you as possible. So I wanna spend time on that role play. So what were your rates, when were your rates last adjusted? And know what percent of your caseload is made up from that payer? What percent of the total number of patients you treat weekly, monthly, whatever, annually, come from Cigna or United Healthcare or Aetna? You should know that. You should know that like the back of your hand. Um, what referral sources in your marketplace actually have those patients and refer to you? Let's say you say, I've got 49 referral sources in my marketplace, because that was an earlier data point. Of the 49, 41 of them see United Healthcare patients and have referred to us in the past, United Healthcare patients. So know what that is. And if, if possible, find out what percentage of their caseload is United Healthcare patients. Sometimes you can find that information, sometimes you can't. What is the average collections per visit and how does that payer stack up against the other people in your marketplace? So like I said, you should know what their collections per visit, what your collections per visit is from that payer, let's say it's Blue Cross, and then you should know company-wide, well, let's say hypothetically Blue Cross, we're averaging you know, $80 per visit on average for those patients. Our clinic's average co collections per visit is 92 and know what that difference is. And why and how and where does it fall in line sequentially from highest paying payer to lowest paying payer? Maybe they're third from the bottom. Maybe they're at the bottom. Maybe they're right there in the middle. You should definitely know that. So that's the end of my list for the data collection. Uh, hopefully some of those were new for you and, and hopefully some of those you're like, yep, I got that. I know all about that and well done for you. So you should know that and I think it's going to help you going forward into our phase two. Phase two is figuring out and, 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 and landing on what you think is the most influential factors that you can bring up in the conversation you're about to have. That is leverage. What do you think is gonna have the greatest impact? What do you think is gonna have the greatest impression? What do you think is gonna lead you closest to the outcome you're looking for? Leverage. I think average reimbursement per insurance carrier and where they fall in that list is very important to them. Because let's face it, they're people too. 
and they have needs and wants as well that you should also be mindful of when you get into the conversation side. That's more of our phase three. So find out or think through what you think is most important to them and find what you have in leverage that is going to touch that rock, that's going to move that stone in the direction of favorable in their mind and from their perspective, right? So I think, you know, where does their average collections per visit fall in your whole list of average collections per visit? Where do they fall in terms of the time frame in which they last had a rate adjustment due to cost of living? You know, nobody wants to fall behind the times they have a hard time making their mortgage, paying their bills and buying cars or staying in their home, nor does the insurance rep that you're gonna be speaking to. That's gonna be important to them too. So <clears throat> here's my list of additional key elements that I think are going to provide you with leverage. Utilization of care. Where do you fall in comparison to your competitors or the national average in terms of your average length of stay? Number of visits from start to finish. Where do you fall in terms of specialized equipment, specialized therapy techniques, specialized services? Something that these providers, these providers, patients, or actually members don't have easy access to, but yet you provide. Well, look, that took a, you got to point out, well, that took greater investment, greater time, greater effort, greater innovation for me to have a McKenzie certified or OCS trained or certified practitioner or a newbie certified and trained practitioner or a dry needler or whatever that may be, pediatric therapist, neural specialist, you know, TMJ specialist, whatever that may be, that separates you from the rest. Look, you're not just doing ABC physical therapy right out of PT school and putting not putting any effort into enhancing and advancing your skills. The payer needs to know that. That's a definite distinguishable difference between your practice and the competitor's practices. Uh, decreased carrier costs by funneling patients into your aftercare program. So do you have an aftercare program? Do you have a wellness program? Are you able to move them through PT, discharge, shorter length of stay, but yet you also have additional cash-based services that cost them nothing? but allows the patient to get up to a higher degree of outcome, a higher degree of optimum health. They're only gonna achieve that in your clinic because other practices don't have that, right? Um, what do your referral sources say about you in a letter? Ask your five or six favorite physicians who send to you on a regular basis to write a letter about how they feel about your clinic. How are you different? How are you special? What are the outcomes that they see with your practice that they don't see in many other practices? How do they feel about referring to you? Do they have a degree of confidence that they can rate? You know, I am a 10 out of 10 in confidence that when I send ABC therapy, they're going to achieve the outcomes and, and performances that I'm looking for my patient to achieve. Anything like that, greater collaboration, cooperation, communication, whatever the physician can say that's positive, it's going to set you in a separate light. Again, leverage. Put in front of the payers that you won best practice of the year in your county or in your state or whatever certifications or awards you've won. You've got to tout that. This is a time to brag about yourself. Shows self-assuredness. It shows confidence. Shows self-worth. What do you, oh, I'm sorry, let me start again on that list. Uh, next is what does your patient say about you in terms of outcomes, experience, net promoter score, goal attainment. Hey, I thought it was going to, you know, I love patient letters where I thought it was going to take six weeks before I could reach overhead and do my hair or put my coat on a hanger. Within three weeks time, I was doing all of that. ABC therapy did techniques that I've never seen before. They had manual skills. They had certifi certified therapists that just went above and beyond what my expectations were in terms of my patient care. Get those kinds of letters. How does your clinic services stack up against other clinics in your area? I already said that one. That's a very big point though. What can you advertise that you do that other people cannot do? And then last but not least, here's my end of phase two, but it's probably the most influential leveraged, leveraged element that you can put out there. And it's, and it's a combination of things. So let me share it with you. I think the biggest point that you need to make is how the payer is going to benefit to a greater extent from the relationship that they have with you by increasing the reimbursement value they have to share with you so you can further enhance the outcomes that are solely beneficial to them, such as reduced costs because I get my people better quicker because I have a lower recidivism rate. I have a lower rate of people coming back again for the same condition because it didn't stick, it didn't last. Three months later, I moved the window and again, I got shoulder impingement, I have to get therapy again. 
because I have a lower average length of stay because of the skilled services, the innovative care, the advanced care, the higher technology that we use in our practice. Because of my goal achievement, patients are coming here because they're achieving their goals more comprehensively, I guess. Just because somebody can raise their arm to a certain degree of motion isn't enough in my book. Like, what can they do with that functional outcome? Demonstrate that you have functional goals of a higher level of performance, a higher level of independence with your patients that other practices don't have. When the list is compiled that is in the favor of the payer in terms of saving them what is important and meaningful and important to them, they're gonna wanna send you all day. And trust me, don't fall into this trap thinking the only thing they wanna save is money. They wanna save time, headaches, complaints. They wanna save uh, documentation time. They, they don't, believe me, they don't wanna keep have, seeing the same patient show up on their books, having to authorize more visits, to verify more insurance three times over for the same hip issue or the same back issue or the same shoulder issue. They wanna see that they've sent this patient's care to the best provider and that provider resolved the case once and done, right? Saves them a ton when they have that degree of confidence in a practice like yours and you have to show them why they should have confidence in a practice like yours because of your skilled therapist, because of your great uh, uh, clinical efficiency, because of your great administrative uh, advanced technology and utilization of that technology and the economization in terms of how you actually work the patient to their long-term goals and then they don't have a high recidivism rate. Focus now on phase three, okay? So let's, let's just assume you've, you've got all your data because they could ask you any question. You better have that quick cheat sheet of data answers right there in front of you. You've got your talking points, your bulleted talking points, which I call leverage. You kind of pulled that from your data, pulled that from your mind, pulled that from where you think your strongest, your, your most uh, best positioned to have this conversation with them. So that's your leverage. And then what you wanna do is you wanna call them you want to ask for the rep that is in charge of the reimbursement rates, the rep that's in charge of contracting, okay? Do not talk to the low-level person. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but this isn't a decision maker. You're wasting your time. You need to get to the decision maker who can set and establish your rates. Who is the rep over your book of accounts? Ask them. Talk to them. Go into this as a conversation, not a negotiation. So it's going to go from the viewpoint of, I want to share with you some of the reimbursement rates we're currently experiencing from other carriers. I want to point out to you the rates we're currently getting from you. I want to share with you what makes our facility different than other facilities. And I'm aware that almost everybody's going to want to say that, but I actually have proof. I actually have data points that I'd like to share with you as to why. I want to have a conversation with you about how we can have a better rapport and relationship moving forward together in my Spokane market or in my Albuquerque market or wherever I may be because these members are important to you and your business model and these members are our patients and they're important to us and our practice model. So we have the same vested interest. Let's find some common ground where we can save you time, money, and effort and you can help us help more people in a in a healthier financial manner so I can continue to afford to hire better people, provide and invest better, invest in them and provide better level of care, higher level of training, higher level of innovative technologies on the clinical level and administrative level for the experience of our patients. Whom are your members? Let's see what we can do to find some common ground to do that. And let's also talk about the justification for this. We haven't had a cost of living adjustment for the last five years and as you know, the, the cost of living has gone up an average of 3.2% for the last five years. I mean, heck, five times three is over a 15% increase. And as you all know, in the last 36 months, inflation is up over 17, 18%, depending on which economic calculator or government number you want to hang your hat on, but a minimum of a 17% overall uh, inflationary rate f for how we are actually getting by today in, in, in our life, right? And we've had no changes that are going to help us to offset that. What is the average reimbursement rate in America right now at $81 to $83 a visit? That may help some of you. That may not help some of you. So know that number and see how you can leverage that. But most of all, be confident. Be a good listener and communicate based on patient outcomes, based on the practices, special specialties, specialty services, specialty providers that you have, and based on the need for change because the reimbursement rate you're currently getting is 
unsatisfactory for the degree of services and the level of care that you're providing their members. Have that in your DNA, in your body, and if so, it should go something like this. So let's throw the notes away and let's just talk about how it's gonna go. Phone, ring, they pick up. Hi, this is Brian Geller. I was calling for Sharon Roberts, um, senior rep for our physical therapy contract. Yes, this is Sharon. Thanks, Brian, for calling. I know we had this appointment set up. Oh, great, Sharon, is this still a good time? Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. What can I do for you? Well, Sharon, I just wanted to have a conversation with you. Again, this is not a negotiation, everybody. I just wanted to have a conversation with you because I wanted to share that I feel we have a lot of common ground, but we have a dire need for change here in my Spokane market. Um, and I hope I can actually put some information in front of you that will be um, worthy enough of your consideration and hopefully leave you with an impression that allows us to work together in a collaborative manner for the future care of our patients in a way that goes above and beyond where we're sitting today. Well, what does that mean for us, Brian? And, and how, how is it that um, this has come to be for today's call? Well, Sharon, we've not approached Blue Cross in over five years for a rate adjustment. And I don't take that lightly. I know you have a business to run. I know you have members to service. And as you know, many of those members are in fact our patients. And to that end, we both have a vested interest in seeing that they live their life on a week to week, month to month, year to year basis in optimum health with the highest degree of independent function as humanly possible. And I am dedicated, I am devoted, and I have a team of therapists here that are dedicated and devoted to that same outcome. So much so, I think we lead the pack in that in that effort. I think we are the zebra amongst the pack of horses when you look at the quality of care and you look at the outcome of care with our patients. If you don't mind, I'd love to share with you just a few bullet point factors that I'd like you to consider as we make this formal request for a rate adjustment in our reimbursement for the therapy patients we're currently seeing for you there at Blue Cross. Is that okay? Yeah, sure, Brian, go ahead, shoot. Well, I wanna start off with number one. We have invested thousands of dollars in the clinical educational experience of our providers, of our therapists, of our doctors of physical therapy or our OT providers, whomever you have in your practice, to make sure that they're practicing at the top 10% of their license. Here in my practice, I have McKenzie certified back therapists, therapists that have gone and spent thousands of dollars and months of time to have an advanced level of training and how to remedy radiculopathies and disc herniations and you know lumbar sprains and strains, which as you know is a $10 billion business in this country with low back pain. We have providers that are using an advanced piece of technology here in our clinic and are certified in the application of that. It's now in division one schools, hospital centers, professional sports, and clinics all around the country. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's the newbie ESTEM. And it's a rehab protocol with a, a mixed current application that actually resolve cases in a fraction of the time that it used to take us. We have people with high level certified manual therapy training. We have people that are OCS certified, you know, orthopedic specialists here on our staff. So I think just providing you this list of providers and their credentials, I think I can make a strong case that our quality of providers is a step above many of the competitors within our market. And secondly, I went and did some research on our market within a 30 minute drive of our practice. There's five, six other practices. I researched their services and none of them are carrying the specialty services one, three, and six that I just named to you out of that list of seven I just gave you. Secondly, I think there's a need for change. I think there's a definite need for change from the fact that we just haven't had a rate adjustment in five and a half years. Inflation is up over the last 36 months by 17%. And we are definitely $11 below the national average of $83 a visit. And when I rank the Blue Cross reimbursement in comparison to the other you know, insurance providers in our, in our community that we are currently seeing patients for, we have a, a list of 18 providers and Blue Cross Blue Shield is number five from the bottom. So I just think that your value, your deemed value of your members and your perception of their overall health and well-being is more important to you than being number five from the bottom of the list of 18. I know it is for us, but we need some help. We need some help. We need to work together 
both financially and through greater levels of efficiency and effort to ensure that the patients are getting the outcomes that they deserve. To that end, what we've brought in in our practice is an aftercare program. So therefore, we can actually get people through their physical therapy care, their skilled level care, their reimbursed care at a quicker pace, achieve outcome goals, you know, measurable outcome goals of independence and function in an earlier window of time, thus affording them the opportunity to go on a cash basis to our aftercare program where they can achieve the optimum level of care with our massage therapists, our Pilates instructors, and our personal fitness trainers. Maybe you guys listening to me right now have one of those three, but you know, I just listed some as an example there. This is represented in our average length of stay. I know for a fact in calling around to several other clinics or talking to several other therapists that the average length of stay in this market is about 12 visits from start to finish. We seem to be getting our patients achieving their long-term goals. Nine to 10 visits at a time is about our average. So we're shaving off a good two to three visits over the average in our community. That's a cost savings to Blue Cross. That's a cost savings to our patients. And that is acknowledgement and validation to us that we are practicing at a higher level of performance. We really strongly encourage continuing education, job sharing, educational sharing, experience sharing, mentoring, coaching internally within our practice, and it shows in our patient outcomes. And most importantly than the objective measures, to be honest with you, is what do our patients say about us? I'm providing you with three letters from different patients on what they have to say. I'm going to provide you with five letters from referring physicians in our market, what they have to say about our practice, our patients, and their outcomes. And our net promoter score, which is one question. We ask every patient when they're discharged, how likely are you to come back again if care was needed and how likely are you to refer a friend, family member, coworker, or peer to our clinic? And if it's a nine or higher, it's, it's a promoter. I mean, it's somebody who counts. So here's our promoter score. What percentage of people are actually rating us at a nine or higher? And it's off the charts. So I think the performance is in the, is in the data, it's in the stats. I think the caring is in the nature of the specialty services I provided to you. And I think the need for change is in the hard data financially of where we stack up in our marketplace. So I would love to hear what you have to say. And if there's anything else you feel that we can do better to better align with you and your efforts, I'm all ears and I've got a pen and paper. I'm ready to jot it down and see what we can do together. But I am definitely wholeheartedly 100% confident that we are standing here today, sitting here today with a justification, clinical, emotional, physical, educationally for a rate adjustment and how we're providing our physical therapy, private practice services to your patient population, to your member population, if you will. If there's anything more you've ever heard or think of that you believe we could do above and beyond what I've shared with you, I'm all ears and I'm happy to address that as well. Where do you think we could go from here? Well, I don't know, Brian, you know, it's hard economically on everybody, but I do hear what you're saying. And yes, I, I do know that it is hard. And I, I'm sure you have financial constraints as well. But I am well aware as, as just a point of fact that the premiums of people who are getting Blue Cross Blue Shield each and every year over the last five years have gone up. I mean, what they're actually paying for their for their premiums, their monthly premiums for their participation has gone up, their out-of-pocket expenses have gone up. So there has been this rate increase from the populace into Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm simply asking that that actually be passed along to the providers who are actually providing the care. I think we've uh, made several good points uh, justifying that request. How do you feel about you know an adjustment at this point in time and making a change with us? Well, okay, Brian, I guess that it does. You have several good points. We haven't looked at this in quite a while. Our standard practice is to do a 3% rate increase. Well, I understand that may be the standard practice, but given the fact we haven't had a rate increase in over five years, are you suggesting 3% a year and we're getting caught up? So it's actually a 15% rate adjustment? And then stop, shut up. Like say something really like out of what you're expecting and let them kind of talk you back to some midway point. Oh no, Brian, no, you're misunderstanding. We're talking 3% overall from where you are today. Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Sharon. I, I meant Sharon I, Roberts. I guess I said her name was Sharon Roberts. I'm not sure. But I'm sorry, Mrs. Beasley. Um, that's not acceptable. We, I, I really, I, I'm really wanting you to review and rethink that. And I'm hoping that you can reconsider that that rate is maybe something on an annual basis. But we really have to have some acceptable change in rate to go from fifth from the bottom to somewhere in the middle. I mean, 
where I'm looking to be at this point is a rate adjustment of at least $5 more per visit from where we are. I don't know what that comes out to be percentage wise, but that still doesn't get us to the national average, but it at least brings us closer. And I think it's very much justifiable in everything that I've shared with you so far. How do you feel about that? And then let's just go back and forth and see what we can do. But know your leverage points and know what your response has to be to their thing. If they cry poverty, you got to point out, well, wait a minute. I haven't seen that you know, in the news. I see that Blue Cross rates have gone up 27% over the last five years. You know, Be willing to say it, but positively, like, and good for you guys. You say, and, 25, and good for you guys. I'm happy that you've been able to have your business model that's been able to keep up with the cost of living adjustments. I'm only asking for the same. I'm only asking for the same experience that you all have experienced from taking higher premiums from our patients, from, our, from your members. So there you go, guys. I don't want to keep going on and on in this, in this week's. Uh, I hope this you know, was substantial. I hope this was informational. I hope this was educational. And best of all, I hope you were entertained in a way that you were like, I can remember that. I can do that. I am now encouraged. I am now motivated. I am now you know, confident that calling an insurance carrier and asking for a re- rate adjustment is not going to be scary. I have all the tools. I have all the pieces of information I need to get into that call. And most of all, as I hang up with you and as we end this podcast, I hang up like we're on the phone. As I hang up with you and we move on, be confident, be certain, and have conviction in your position because this is not a negotiation. This is simply a conversation. Be up tone, be positive, and be certain in your skill set, be certain in your beingness, be confident in who you are, and be very, very persistent in getting what you set out for because it's the right thing. Not because you're trying to drag one down and raise yourself up, but because you're just trying to bring yourself to even. You're just trying to do right by your patients, your staff, and your practice. That matters, everybody. That matters. It's not a money grab. It's a fairness thing. Have that in your DNA and in your heart when you get on the phone. They will feel it. This should not be a hard conversation. And don't be surprised if they're like, okay, we'll adjust your rate. What would you? What, what are you thinking? Okay, we're thinking this, you're thinking that. Okay, we'll settle on that. Sometimes they just want to get off the phone and move on and they're just going to jump right to the chase and be like, hey, in that case, stop talking. If you feel that insistence, you feel that person, just let them go, get, get a number, ask for more, settle on a number and move on. Don't feel like you have to go through your whole list. You can abandon ship, you know, pivot pivot. If they're ready to adjust your rate, take it. Sometimes you don't even have to go more than five minutes on the phone. You already got what you're asking for. So I wish you all the best. I hope you all do really great with that. If I can be of any help or assistance with you in this application of this particular technique or something else in the business of physical therapy, reach out to us. And if you're going to CSM, see us there. If you don't, you don't. We'll see you next year at PPS, but you can call me anytime. Go to my website, check out our services. We're here to see that your business is succeeding in business for your success, your ideal scene, your screaming proficiency can be done through just better practice management. Okay, so that's it. I wish you all the best. As always, start each and every day expecting to do well.